and welcome to Forever Wild, a television show dedicated to environmental education in the Horry County Schools. We have a nice special guest here today. His name is William Johnson. He will be helping us uh, learning about some very interesting topic. It has something to do with this equipment here in the background. Hey, William, what are we learning about this time? So today we're going to teach uh, individuals about how to get started uh, with stargazing and astronomy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll so, give them the basics. So give them the basics of starting up astronomy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how did you get involved in astronomy? A little bit of your background. So uh, astronomy, I was, I started out in one of the first camps I actually spent out here mm -hmm. when I realized how many stars there were actually in the sky. I started to really take to it. And right after I finished school, I was able to spend a few nights out at Fort Jackson mm -hmm. at the graduation field and I was looking up at the stars and I really, really took to it and I really wanted to learn. And I picked up this book right here, uh, The Starfinder. Mm -hmm. And what this has inside is something called a planisphere. And this is just like a, it's basically a sky map for the nighttime sky. Hmm. And after staring at this for a little while and staring up at the sky, those, these patterns all start to kick in. And once you figure out a few constellations, it gets easier because we're, you know, we're pattern recognizing animals. So mm -hmm. we start to look we start to see the connections and make the connections a little bit easier. So this is kind of how I would, how everything got started to move. That's interesting. So you're talking about a, uh, a planisphere and a star finder. Can we get kind of a close-up shot of that and see what that looks like? Well, you can see mine here has some heat damage. <laughs> <laughs> That's really interesting. So if you're using a planisphere, how would somebody go about using something like that. You're saying that's almost like a map of the night sky. Mm -hmm. So a planisphere is used, not place this down for a second. A planisphere is used, it has the north, uh, west, east, and south horizons on here, mm -hmm. and you rotate it. And you have the hours along the edge, and you also have days of the year. And uh, each night, a star that rose on the horizon, mm -hmm. it rises four minutes earlier the next night. And so as it comes up, the stars are going to change throughout the year. So you're going to see they're going to, the stars are going to rise a little bit earlier, and a little bit earlier, and a little bit earlier. And then, so the sky, you, when you look up in January, you're going to see something totally different at, let's say, 9 o'clock than you would have at June or July. That just explains how the, the date and hours works. But once you figure out the date and the time, then you're going to hold it up to the sky, and let's say the north is over here. And then you should be able to tell um, what constellations is what constellations are, and they'll be placed throughout the sky. And you just follow them from horizon to horizon. And you also have a path called the ecliptic, which all your major constellations um, follow along, as well as the planets. The ecliptic. How do you, how do you know you're looking at the ecliptic when you look at the night sky? So right here, the ecliptic is this this yellow line. Mm -hmm. that, that travels across, and ours is at an angle because we're not at the equator. But uh, this, this path, if you look for major constellations like uh, Cancer here, Gemini, Orion, these all follow along right around the ecliptic, including if you were able to look up and see Jupiter and Mars, mm -hmm. our, our morning planets right now, earlier in the year, uh, they will also follow the same path. So generally, all your planets are going to be along the same line. And you can follow that line from one horizon to the other, and you can. Interesting. Yeah. So the, the, all of our planets follow the ecliptic. Mm -hmm. That's what you're saying. That's that's fascinating. That's really cool. Oh yeah. That's uh, so. Uh, it, let me ask you a couple more questions. We've got some equipment back here. Everybody asks about astronomy. Astronomy. What's one of the first things people think of when you think about astronomy? It's equipment. So everyone thinks about the the big telescopes. Uh, just wanting to really get all this equipment. But the biggest thing about astronomy is that you just need your naked eyes and you just go out and observe the sky. You know, you, you go out and what I always tell people is if you can't point it out with your finger, you're not going to be able to find it with a telescope. So what you want to go, uh, what you want to do is you want to go outside, uh, figure things out, use your star map and just learn where all the stars are first. And then you can start considering getting some of the binoculars, and binoculars help. Binoculars are a good thing to start with. This is what I suggest to start with first before mm -hmm. um, telescopes, because they're easier to orient um, towards what you're looking at. You can see at, at minimum you know, 10 times more stars than you would be uh, if you were just using your eyes. And so these are one of the greatest starting tools, what I, what I would recommend. 
Okay. What size binoculars do you have around your neck and why is that important? These are 10 by 50. Mm -hmm. This is, in my opinion, the perfect balance between weight and what you can see. So the objective 50. So it's going to let in a decent amount of light and there you can hold these pretty steady. Right. Now, the ones we have here, so these are 10 by 50 and what are these things right here are 18 to 52 by 80 zooms. Yeah, so these are going to be, be a lot harder to hold steady. Mm -hmm. And you're also probably going to need a tripod to go with these as well. So mm -hmm. especially for the young astronomer, uh, it's probably going to be a little cumbersome and uh, it's very unwieldy to, to use. Right. So a young astronomer can use these full-size binoculars pretty well and they don't mm -hmm. have trouble with that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, is there any other kind of binoculars you recommend for little hands? Do you know of any other out there that do that? So you can get the smaller ones, you know, the 8 by 32s, mm -hmm. uh, just to kind of give them an idea. But especially as they get younger and younger and younger, it's, it's probably easier just to keep it to, to just naked eye astronomy until they get a little bit better at using, um, until they get a little bit better at using the binoculars. Right, right. Well, what age do you find kids are patient enough to do astronomy? So, the coolest thing about astronomy is, is that once you do get set up with telescopes, mm -hmm. it, it's never really too young of an age to sort of have them you know, stare up at the moon. It's absolutely awesome for them to look through and you see the, see the expression on their face because they, they, you know, it's, wow, this moon is huge, you know? <laughs> and so you, you always see it on TV, but it's nothing like seeing it. You feel like a, you know, a, a true astronaut or a true astronomer, if you will, uh, when you look out through a telescope. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Good, cool. Now, you're moving along the continuum. We talk about binocular viewing. What's the next step up if you want to move on in your astronomy um, you know, process? What would you acquire next? What would you do? So if you stick with it, so astronomy, a, a lot of times you'll see someone go out and buy this really huge telescope, mm -hmm. really fancy equipment, and they'll never use it. Uh -huh. So what you want to do is get a, a smaller telescope. I would recommend, my first telescope was a about a six inch diameter. This is a little bit smaller than that, but uh, a four to six inch is a good starter scope. It's easy to swing around. You're gonna get beautiful views of the moon. Mm -hmm. um, and if you really stick with it after that, then you can move up to something like a 10 inch is what I, I personally use. Mm -hmm. And this right here is about 19 or 20 inches. Wow. This is a great instructional scope. However, for personal use, mm -hmm. a telescope is only as good as the amount of time that it gets used. So we don't want to deter people by telling them to go out and get a huge scope and then it just kind of collects dust when they will use a six inch of a day, you know. Gotcha. So it's easier to transport, easier to use. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, now can you take us through the different components of different telescopes? This is a completely different telescope than that one. Mm -hmm. How does it work differently? So generally speaking, when you get into telescopes, you have two types. And what you're going to find is, thank you. What you're going to find is you have reflectors and refractors. Mm -hmm. The easiest way to explain the difference is your refractors use a series of mirrors and lenses okay. that that help focus the light, so they can be a lot smaller in width yeah. or excuse me, circumference. Now your reflectors, they they use just usually one mirror and then they have a mirror up top in here okay and what this allows is they can actually they're actually a lot cheaper so if you, your starter scopes um, you can get something like a 10 inch telescope for 500 bucks now if that was a refractor you'd spend uh, a, a lot more money for something that size right and it's a lot more convenient to carry it carry it around and also your astrophotographers the people who are taking Deep, long exposures of these these images, mm -hmm. they're going up there and they're using uh, refractors to get really nice images. Oh, is that what they're doing? So they're actually using a bigger version of our of our longer scope here. Mm -hmm. Is what they're using instead yeah. of the reflection scope. And is this this is a Dobsonian reflection scope, right? Mm -hmm. So reflection means it's reflecting the what you're seeing off. Of what kind of mirror is that? A concave mirror like a bowl? Or is it convex? It's convex mirror. So it's actually a convex or concave? It's convex, so, or excuse me, concave, sorry. It's concave. Concave, I've got it mixed up. And 
And it works just like a bucket. A lot of people think that, man, this huge thing must magnify the stars really well. Mm -hmm. And it's not really like that. It's more, it takes in more light. And so it's easier, to, it makes objects easier to see versus just because you have a bigger mirror, it's easier to zoom in. It's just a light collection tool versus a magnification tool, like a microscope. Okay, so this, mm -hmm. this is about light collection. Yeah. The more light ways you, you can concentrate on one reflection that comes off this extra mirror here. You've got one mirror that flex light, the other mirror focuses the beam into this. Now, what is this right here? So How does that work? So this is your eyepiece. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a 21 millimeter, so you'll have a nice wide, wide angle view. Uh, this makes it easier to find what you're looking for. So let's say if we were looking at the Orion Nebula, uh, and this is a 25 millimeter, so this is going to give you an even wider view than the 21 millimeter. Mm -hmm. So when you first get out and you're wheeling around, you want to use a 25 just to kind of, especially when you first get started, uh, to kind of find what you're looking for. Then once you get it right, everything lined up, you can switch to a 10 millimeter or a 5 millimeter. And that's going to be able to. That's going to bring that image a little bit closer, and you're going to be able to see it just a little bit better. Huh. So you're saying that the smaller the number, the higher the magnification. Right. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Why, why is that so? So, basically, how it works is it helps just focus that one point just a little bit better. Right. So that that's how that's the easiest way I can explain how that works. But right. it's kind of counterintuitive to think about. You know, like steering a jet up up is down and down is up. Mm -hmm. But that's that's probably the easiest way I can explain it. But I, I usually use a 10 millimeter, mm -hmm. and that's enough to, to see what I need to see. But for instance, during the super moons, 10 millimeter is way too big. But yeah. like now, I wouldn't be able to fit the whole moon. But once the moon backs off and it goes, you know, it fluctuates 30,000 miles closer or further, mm -hmm. and once it backs off, then a 10 millimeter is adequate. So that's the easiest way I can explain what you do when you're first looking at lenses. Okay, that's really awesome. That's really awesome. Well, is this a little refraction lens or is it a reflection lens? So it works. If you look in here, right here, you see how the, the lens is shaped mm -hmm. like that. The shape of that lens and how it focuses light changes ever so slightly as you go up and down the number. And that gives you that different, uh, give, gives you each different kind. So it gives you each different level of magnification okay. in, in a sense. Interesting. Okay, and there's one more part of the scope that we can see right here. What is this, and how is it used? So this, mm -hmm. this is a Barlow lens. Mm -hmm. So some, some you have a, a two times Barlow lens, a three times Barlow lens, and this just changes just how these lens work. It also has a piece of glass right here mm -hmm. that amplifies what you see uh, through these scopes. It's like adding magnification to it a lot. Uh -huh. Two times the power of what you see and this this is a really good tool because it's you can get these relatively they're relatively inexpensive and they can greatly improve uh, what you see through your eyes. Thank you. Okay. So you, in essence you can take a smaller scope and you can do more with it mm -hmm. with this type of equipment. Yep. Uh -huh. Gotcha. Fascinating. Well uh, why do you think it's important for young people to get involved with astronomy? What can it teach them? So astronomy is it's one of those things that it, it just really teaches us to dream and you know, look beyond mm -hmm. and, and think big because when you, when you realize how many, you know, there's just 100 or 200 billion stars in our galaxy alone and it makes you really think on a, on a grander scale. It teaches you things, like it gives you evidence of you know, how the dinosaurs went extinct or mm -hmm. uh, what, why we find different uh, chemicals on Earth and uh, just all these different processes. And another thing that we could consider is uh, climate is always an ongoing issue. And we have you know, different scientists who observe uh, for meteorology or how weather patterns change over time. And if you look out in the space, we can observe something like a greenhouse gas effect on Venus. So these future scientists coming in, they say, we might not be able to find what we're looking for on Earth uh, if, let's say, the greenhouse effect was really crazy. But well, we can look into space and say, and see what happens on Venus. And then at that point, we can say, oh, okay, so this is what happened. So it really just brings in a lot of different things um, that can really wow your kids. And it's just, just a great thing to be a part of. I love spending the night out looking up, and it's a great thing to do with your family as well. That's awesome.
Mm -hmm. So, so it's just a good family activity, mm -hmm. something that can spur your child to learn more about science and yeah. about nature. Uh, that's really awesome. Now, is there any other topics about astronomy that you would like to introduce for the public out there? Anything you'd like to know on the introduction part of this? So on the introduction part, uh, what I like to tell people is one of my favorite books mm -hmm. is Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. Mm -hmm. This was, I've read this book two times already. I'll probably read it again soon. It really puts uh, everything into perspective. And it was, it was actually a pretty easy read. It's not mm -hmm. uh, bogged down with heavy, heavy words, heavy literature. Um, that plus things like watching the International Space Station. Hmm. You, know, it, you can you can type in where is the ISS, where is the International Space Station in Google, and you'll get their page to come up. Mm -hmm. You click on your location on the map, and then that night you and your family can watch the International Space Station light up as it flies past and then disappears. And another thing that you want to keep track of are the uh, meteor showers. Cool. Mm -hmm. The biggest meteor showers in Gemini is in December, and that's always a, a great event. So these are big highlights that people always want to be a part of and it really helps it really makes uh, your astronomy or astronomical viewing for that night more exciting when you see something like that that's awesome now you use a special type of um, it seems like you, you have a special type of device that you use to point out stars mm -hmm. when you're given a program what is that device so there's two lights and or colors that you utilize when you're doing astronomy mm -hmm. so on the teaching side I use a very strong uh, green laser. Mm -hmm. I think it's a 303, that's what it's called. But it, it allows me to shoot out and point out constellations in the sky and objects of interest. On the viewer side, you want to use red light. What you want to do is preserve your night vision because when you're looking from your star map back to the sky, you lose a little bit of your night vision. You're, it takes a little while to get it back and your eyes to reset. So using red light preserves more of that night vision and it doesn't affect it when you're constantly going back from looking at your star map to mm -hmm. looking at the sky. Neat. That's, that's really cool. Well, uh, everybody out there, this is William Johnson. About once to twice a month, we're going to be having a free star party. Our first star viewer party, we had about 20 people. The last one we had about 80. Mm -hmm. We've done about three of them so far. And we look forward to seeing him out here again at Clay Card. And everybody out there, I want you to just really think about astronomy for your family. It's a great way to get outside and learn about nature. It's a huge part of naturalism that we, uh, we need to use. Uh, there is one more section that a lot of people are using now. And what is something along the lines of technology? You talked a little bit about technology. Mm -hmm. How can you use your smartphone to learn about astronomy? So there are several nighttime sky apps mm -hmm. that you can use. You can download them. Uh, and then you can use these by and orient them to the sky as well, and it works just like a planet sphere. Hmm. So it's it's a very quick way to um, interact with the sky. I mean, you can download it in 30 seconds, and you know you're out there shifting around. And once you understand the differences between the constellations, and you start star hopping, which is another very important thing to to uh, learn. You know, you use one constellation, and you might use Orion's belt to to the other mm -hmm. when you're looking at the sky map and it'll make it easier to decipher uh, one constellation from, a, from, from another. Interesting. What are a couple of apps that you like out there for that? So the one I use most often, the one I recommend uh, is just called Nighttime Sky App mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I've gotten that through Google Maps and I'm sure there are several others but any any nighttime app it's going to be it's going to be it's going to it's going to work well. I usually prefer a planet sphere. Okay. Uh, I, I've just had a little bit more success, and it's been a little bit easier for me to use it. And but the the sky app, the sky maps work great, um, especially for quick, easy access. Have you? Now I know the audience is probably thinking this. Have you ever seen anything unusual in the night sky that you couldn't describe what it was? So what I found is the more that you the more time that you spend looking at the sky mm -hmm. and learning about space the less likely you are to, you know, say UFO or, you know, <laughs> aliens. Because you, you look up and before I've never seen the ISS and I didn't know you could see it at night. If I saw something light up for about 30 seconds, fly over the horizon, it disappeared. And I knew it wasn't an airplane because it wasn't, didn't have the flashing wing lights on there. Right. I would definitely think it was UFO. But now that I understand that the ISS, it appears you know, all over the planet. Uh, you know, it, it 
goes around the planet every hour and a half. Right. So, or, or excuse me, satellites do. And it's just, you're gonna, it's gonna be a chance that you get to see it. So, I haven't seen anything out of the ordinary. Gotcha. But definitely I've seen things that are very busy. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Well, uh, do you see man-made satellites? Yeah, that's another cool thing. Mm -hmm. The difference is your airplanes are going to blink in the mm -hmm. sky, but think of a, a, if you just picture a star going across the nighttime sky really slowly, just about that speed right there, mm -hmm. that's a satellite. And it won't blink or anything, it'll just be a consistent light. It'll look like a star just slowly moving across the nighttime sky. That's interesting. Well, that's awesome. I'll tell you what, what would you like to have any closing thoughts to this opening segment of your astronomy program? So I would just like to encourage everyone to get out and look up because it's a lot of amazing things for you out there to see. It's nothing more relaxing than hanging out with your friends, family, or even by yourself and going out and just looking out at the stars and really appreciating what, um, what people have appreciated for you know, since you know forever. So it's, it's really nice and that's what I would like to encourage people. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, William. I appreciate it. And everybody look for William Justin Johnson and his STAR Party program at Play Card Environmental Education Center. Look for us online. Look for us on Facebook. Look for us on our, our regular website there. And uh, we're going to basically, after this opening segment, we're going to go out and we're going to show some photographs that were taken in the night sky to kind of get you guys enthusiastic about wanting to go out and study, uh, study the night sky. We're also going to take these scopes out and show you how to set them up. So let's get going. Thank you. Right. Thank you. All right.